two days after this scene, General Bonaparte set off for Paris, leaving me at the Congress with Monsieur Pure, Secretary of the Legation at Camp Formio. I cannot take you with me to Paris, he said. The Directory has not yet forgot your conduct on the 18th Fructidor, and this is not the fit moment for justifying yourself. I shall make you amends for this hereafter. Remain here. Write me all you hear of the diplomatic gossip. You will not easily find again the same opportunity of gaining instruction. I leave you with some of my servants, for I want people to think that I shall soon be back. His intention was not, however, to restart, return to Restat, the difficulties brought in by the insinuations of Monsieur de Thuguier. Every moment impeded the negotiations. After three months' debate, nothing was agreed on as to the manner of concluding. The deputies of the powers of the Second Order in Germany, a great many members of the immediate nobility, and the numerous and rich holders of livings, sought support from the King of Prussia, who had neither the will nor the power to protect them. Convinced of the hatred of the emperor and of his resolution to sacrifice them, the great number amongst them sought another support by secret negotiations with the minister of France. My position had become difficult. I was detested by the members of the directory and consequently mistrusted by the plenipotentiaries of the republic. I could not mention the real motive that kept me at Rostadt. My presence at the Congress was displeasing to Messieurs Trillihar and Bonnier, and the ministers of Germany, obliged by their position to offer a kind reception to the French who resided with them, looked upon me as the representative and, finding it less painful to have a connection with an officer who enjoyed the confidence of General Bonaparte, they bestowed on me alone the attention they ought to have divided among us and left nothing but cold ceremony for the others. Consequently, I was continually in company with Count Cobenzel and the family of Metternich. But I took care not to acquaint General Bonaparte with my new position. He approved of it, recommending me, however, to act with due discretion. I shall not repeat the particulars of what took place during five months in this small German town. Diplomatic prattle, debates, generally without result, grand dinners, and ennui would by no means interest the reader. However, he may possibly be glad to know what I have since learned respecting the murder of the plenipotentiaries of the Republic. These particular were communicated to me by the Prince of Leningen and the Count of Solms Laubach, with whom I was very intimate. They were at Rostadt on their own business and showed in that catastrophe much courage and devotion for our unfortunate ministers. These ministers had eagerly taken advantage of the secret proceedings of the ministers of the second and third rank and several members of the nobility of Germany. In hopes of being spared if the war broke out again, they promised to side with France. These secret dealings could not escape me, as by the situation of my apartments in the castle, I frequently met the secretaries of legation of the small princes of Germany, sneaking in at Messieurs Trailhard and Bonnier's lodging, which were not very distant from mine. When Monsieur Robert Yo came instead of Monsieur Trailhard, those maneuvers grew still more frequent. He had filled several diplomatic missions, and his manners were more polite and attractive than those of his colleagues. Count Lerbach, a man of determined character, full of energy and a sworn enemy of France, was undoubtedly soon acquainted with the disposition of the hidden foes of Austria. The more the negotiations advanced, the more evident it appeared that the peace would not be of long standing. And the war was already secretly resolved when the news came that General Bonaparte had embarked for the East with some of the most able French generals and 30,000 of the best troops of the Republic. Count Lerbach left Rastatt a short time before the commencement of hostilities, and it can scarcely be doubted but that it was he who induced the Austrian cabinet to resolve to arrest the ministers of France, a regiment of hussars of... Sheckler, a sort of pandier, recruited on the frontiers of Turkey, already surrounded Rastatt when the French ministers received an order to leave the place. The Baden commander of the town had in vain advised them to set off in the morning that they might cross the Rhine before nightfall. 
Their preparations caused delay. They were encumbered with papers they wished to keep, and they were besides convinced that their sacred character of ambassadors would shelter them from insult. The day was far advanced when they departed. At a few leagues from Ristat, they were stopped and murdered. I am persuaded that the Austrian government did not give an order for murdering them, but only for seizing their papers, while the soldiers, finding a great deal of money about them, urged by avarice and probably intoxicated, thought the best way would be to stifle their complaints by murdering them. I arrived at Paris about a month before our departure for Toulon. I shall speak hereafter of my marriage with Mademoiselle Emily Beauharnais. The preparations of the Eastern Expedition had been made very secretly. The Directory had not even entrusted to their clerks the task of copying the various orders that were to be transcribed, and the secret had been so well kept that England in no way suspected our design, nor could take any means to prevent it. Fourteen ships of the line were assembled at Toulon. Each ship took only half the necessary number of seamen. The rest of the crews was composed of all the regiments of the army. Admiral Breeze commanded the fleet, and the officers who served under his orders, all full of ardor, had most of them already acquired reputation as clever men. Besides the fleet of Toulon, troops were embarked at Genoa. Ayaccio and Civite Vecchia had received orders to join the fleet before its arrival at Malta. I embarked on board the frigate Artemisia, which was a sort of aide-de-camp to the admiral. The flotilla of General Desay not having come to the rendezvous, the Artemisia was sent on discovery. General Murat joined us, and when we were not far from Malta, he obliged the captain to give him a boat that he might go down to the outward defenses of Valletta. This was an act of imprudence. He was also guilty of another which I shall mention because it gives an idea of the character of that general. While cruising before Malta, the only man of war the order possessed came up to us, wanting to get into the port. Nura, Nura made a signal for her to steer leeward of our frigate. This was contrary to custom. But the captain of the Maltese ship being taken unawares and intimidated at sight of the tricolored flag obeyed the signal without hesitation. On his arrival, he spread the alarm and the city, which we might have taken by surprise, was in a state of defense when we landed. On the 10th of June, the fleet at last appeared in sight of Malta. The aspect of so large a fleet, with 400 transports and a formidable army, threw the Grand Master and his council into the greatest dismay and spread confusion among the knights and inhabitants of the island. The disorder augmented, and a French knight had already been murdered by the populace of the city. When the general-in-chief sent his aide-de-camp, Junot, to summon the Grand Master to open the gates, the answer being that the government was resolved to defend the place. A part of the army landed, attacked all the small forts which defended the shore, took possession of them, and soon after invested the town. The fortifications of Valletta consist of a ditch dug in the rock, the dimensions of which make an attack extremely difficult. It was quite impossible to open the trenches, as all the island together could not have procured us wood, nor even earth enough to establish our batteries and shelter us from the fire of the fortress. Fortunately, the Grand Master was seized with fear. The Russian consul had already required that the island should be delivered over to some Russian troops who were expected. The Grand Master, fancying that the Order of Malta was irretrievably lost and forgetting that from one moment to another an English fleet might arrive and deliver him, resolved to sign a capitulation with General Bonaparte. The treaty was soon concluded, and two days after our arrival, the army was master of that city and forts, and the fleet at anchor in the fine harbor of Valletta. General Caffarelli, on examining more minutely the fortifications, said to the general-in-chief, It is very lucky for us 
that there were people in the place to open the gates for us. For if it had been deserted, the army would never have gotten in, notwithstanding all our exertions. Next day, the Grand Master and all his officers went on board of a brick, and I received orders to conduct them with the frigate Artemisia to the extremity of the Adriatic Gulf, that they might not fall into the hands of the Barbary Corsairs, who would have considered them glorious trophies. Two days after our departure, we met a Ragusan vessel, from whom we learned that she had set in the morning an English fleet steering towards Malta. Fortunately, the army and its chief were already gone off. Our great fleet, with our 400 transports, sailed during the night along the north coast of Candia, while Nelson was waiting for it on the south. It was long discussed in the fleet what could have been the result if Nelson had met us. The military officers, and especially those who were on board the ships of the line, were convinced that we should have beaten the English fleet. General Bonaparte supported that opinion by all the authority his name could add to it. I must, however, acknowledge that I never shared it. 400 transports, the captains of which were but in a small part Frenchmen, and which extended along all points of the horizon, would quickly have been dispersed by the English frigates. In spite of all of our exertions, we should have experienced great losses. The Egyptian expedition would no more have been practicable, but the army might have thrown itself on the coast of Sicily and made itself master of that island. The cowardice of the Grand Master and the wretched defense of the Knights of Malta were a stroke of fortune that seemed to protect the destiny of the General Chief. I had received an order to inspect the fortifications of Corfu and the magazines with which that city was provided. From thence, I was to go and acquaint Ali, the Pacha of Janina, with the conquest of Egypt and try to persuade him that as we remained friends with the Grand Seigneur, it was his interest not to break with France. My mission was difficult and dangerous. We knew Ali Pasha for a man incapable of keeping faith. He was then on a good understanding with the troops dispersed through the Ionian Islands and the coast of that part of Greece over which he had command. But it was certain he would abandon us and become our enemy as soon as his policy might show him any advantage on the other side. When I arrived at Corfu, I met General Chabot, who asked me whether I was the bearer of rich presents for Ali Pasha and of a great deal of money to pave my way. For he added, these are the best arguments you can make use of with him. These were precisely the things General Bonaparte had forgot. But, said he, you need not be uneasy. The Pasha's on the Danube fighting much against his will at Udin with Paswan Ogla. This account took a great burden off my mind. I hastened to execute the other part of my mission and got to Egypt. At a few leagues from Apukir, whither I had received orders to go, the frigate I was on board of was chased by an English vessel that came to reconnoitre the fleet. This happened on the 21st of July. I went on board the Orient to see Admiral Brees, the commander of the fleet. I had not expected to find the fleet moored in the roads of Abu Kir. The following is word for word what the Admiral said to me. When General Bonaparte left Alexandria to penetrate into the desert, he gave me the choice either to enter the old port of Alexandria or to go with the fleet to Corfu after having landed all the goods and provisions of the army. Since that moment, I've received no account whatever from the army nor its leader. I have sounded the passes of the old port, but it can only be answered with a northwest wind and by boats. This has taken up much time and is the only ship that has as yet been able to get into the port. It is quite impossible for me to leave the coast of Egypt before I receive accounts from the army. Can I set off and enter a port of Europe without having any satisfactory news to give France and her government? If what I scarcely think possible, General Bonaparte were to find in the country insurmountable obstacles, and if he were obliged to reembark, would it not be a criminal act on my part to deprive him of the only means of retreat he has left at my disposal? 
I have seen today an English vessel for the first time since I've been here. Most probably, I shall be attacked tomorrow or the day after. I shall send for the vessel that is in the old port. If you follow my advice, you will remain with us. I have sanguine hopes of success, and you will enjoy the satisfaction of carrying to your general the intelligence of a glorious victory. As I could neither enter the old port of Alexandria nor go away, I have taken up a sort of military position here. I've been forced to moor the ships. Because having left too alone with half crews, I have not men enough to fight sailing. To this admiral, Gantium added, We are at some distance from the island you see yonder because the ground there will not hold our anchors and it would be dangerous to run nearer to the shore, but we are defended from that side by a formidable battery. After my conversation with the admiral, I went during the night alone over that immense ship, which carried 130 guns. I did not meet a single person upon deck. It appeared to me as if I were in the church of Notre Dame. A circumstance that made the solitude still more singular was that before our landing, there had been 2,145 persons on board. And at that moment, there were not above 600. The more I examined that vast floating citadel, the less inclined I felt to take part in the battle. In fact, I was not a sea officer and my duty was to join my general. There would be no want of messengers to bring him intelligence of a victory. Whilst I should reap much blame and very little pity if by some disaster or other I were to be taken prisoner or killed. I went therefore to the admiral and said to him, After mature consideration, I am resolved to continue my journey. I must give an account of my mission and the position wherein I found you. He gave me a boat to carry me to Rosetta, but I soon repented the step I had taken. The swell occasioned by the meeting of the Nile with the sea was then very strong and a violent tempest added to the danger that threatened us. A vessel laden with provisions had just been totally lost. Another much larger, which was still struggling, was kind enough to throw us a rope that we might fasten the boat to her and avoid running out to sea where we might go to the bottom or split upon the breakers. We remained 17 hours in that situation when at last the sea growing a little less boisterous. I proposed getting forward at a quick rate so as to gain the mouth of the Nile. The sailors were not much pleased at my plan, but I seconded I was seconded by the ensign who commanded the boat and who was a young man full of energy and intrepidity. The first billow nearly submerged us. One more effort was necessary, and while the sailors, pale as death, continued rowing with vigor, one of my traveling companions, an officer in the guides, fell on his knees and began the Lord's Prayer, of which he did not omit a single word. When the danger was over, his courage returned, and ashamed of an act he could not himself comprehend, he whispered to me, I am now 38 years old, and from my sixth year, I never said a prayer in my life. I cannot conceive how I recollected that one, and I do declare it that at the present moment, I should not be able to repeat a single word of it. This officer was nevertheless one of the bravest of the Egyptian army. I think he died a general of the brigade in Spain.